friends, I'm DJ Lance Rock, and I have to say, Rock and Roll Grad School is awesome! This is Rock and Roll Grad School with your hosts, Heidi Hedquist and Luke Poling. When do they get to sing my way? Hello, kitties. We are going to have, I'm going to say a great time together. Yes. Because we have Noelle on the show. Yes. And you would think somebody who's put out one record thus far, but it's a great record. We should give the backstory about noel so if you don't know who noel is one you have and this one runs a little bit longer because we wanted to talk with her she's awesome she is uh do you want to tell the the backstory no because you get so excited i like the way you tell it really yeah okay this is actually what a compliment i'll give you don't get used to it well that's why we're recording this I know. So <laughs> Noel was performing in Los Angeles at the Troubadour uh, mm-hmm. with her band. As she gets off stage, she passes two interesting looking gentlemen in the audience. Very handsome gentlemen. Incredibly handsome. Mm-hmm. That's what made them interesting because the rest of the club was just filled with, I don't know, dogs. But she walks as by. The Troubadour them. often was. Yes, as everyone knows, a lot of uggos <laughs> hang out at the Troubadour. <laughs> totally, always. Yes. People and... are going to think that this story's not true. We got to take that back. Okay, sorry. So she's. But they were incredibly handsome. Yes, that is true. This is and still are and Let's still are get that and on the record uber talented. And for those who don't realize, these are two people we adore. Yes. So as Noelle is walking through the crowd or backstage, she is uh two gentlemen come up and introduce themselves to her and they are ron and russell male of sparks our favorite people some of our favorite people in the world yes writers of some of the greatest songs of all time yeah including the number one song in heaven this is true literally and figuratively exactly Mm -hmm. and they have written and recorded a dance album that they've been looking for a female vocalist to sing on and they have chosen noelle she's perfect so we get into the story in the interview but this record came out she toured for it briefly record label shenanigans happened because they always happen this record has been out of print for decades and if you want to buy it on vinyl like the originals uh, be prepared discogs is quite an expensive investment if you're looking for that but the story but, has many layers which we won't spoil that go yes. far beyond just the record there's a lot of famous names that pop up beyond mm-hmm. the males some very very famous billionaires some very famous yes. fashion designers some definitely. very famous monkeys yes with double e's not ey's not coco right that's a right. gorilla. I know. That's okay. But after all of these trials and tribulations and people for years, been there being rumors about this album, no one knowing the full origin story of this album, the male brothers and in their infinite wisdom have reissued it on their own label with on the CD, there's a extra disc of bonus tracks, including some tracks they recorded for the record that didn't make it to the record a lot of tracks with Russell's uh, guide vocals on it. And it's just a a chance to see the process in a way that uh, no one was able to see in 1979. And for Sparks fans who came up later, this has been sort of a, what was this thing? And Noel is not the most, uh, I don't know, it's, it, Wikipedia describes her as, um, quiet and keeping to herself and not wanting to and we cut this all out because this doesn't sound good at all well yeah i mean you could cut this part out but it's she's not um 
She's not a hermit, but no, she doesn't. She's not someone who's like going shouting from the rooftops who she is. Like, look at me. I, you know, she's had a lovely. Right. She continues to have a lovely life and career where she hasn't. She's not braggadocious by any means. No, and we were thrilled to talk to her. It was an we, honor. We were felt it, very fortunate to get be selected to get to talk to her. Very much so, and this is a great chance to hear Noel and uh, get to hear her story. And she's super cool and super interesting and engaging and fun. And it, she's if I didn't like the record great. before to to talk to her a little bit and just know her story and and to get a sense of her personality makes it all the better. Yeah. So do you remember our friend Happy Hoffman? I do. Yes. So she has a new EP coming out this summer. Um, but before that, she has a, a song, I believe, available everywhere uh, on Ooh. all digital platforms uh, called Shooting Star, not the Bob Dylan song. Okay. Um, but it's a tribute to dad. Um, and so this is her, you know, she, she was a lot of fun to talk to. She's doing all sorts of stuff. But if you're looking for something to probably make dad uh, turn into a puddle of tears, mm -hmm. put on the new happy single and hey. stay tuned for the EP. So all I'm right. just, I'm, I'm trying to give us updates on previous guests. I like that. We need to do that. We do. Um, our friends, Apocalyptica just announced a U.S. tour mm -hmm. ne next winter. So it's a ways away, but, you know, it's something to look forward to. Yes. And the I, I'm on their mailing list. And the emails I've gotten, so they have, not only do they have, when we talked with the kind of creator and lead cellist of the group, not only do they have Robert Trujillo, is that how you say it? I believe mm -hmm. this if you listen to the interview, you'd be like, why haven't you learned that yet? I haven't learned it yet. It's okay. um, he's on one track. James Hetfield's on another track. And the thing they just sent out or announced, it sounds amazing. They took a Cliff Burton bass part and played along with that. Okay. So they have the first Metallica bassist on this record as well with everybody else, which I thought was kind of neat. That's awesome. They went to... Cliff's family and got permission to use his part on this record. And that's awesome. You know, and for them, I would assume as as big Metallica fans, like, you know, it's that's as cool as having James Hetfield do his underbite, like devil horns on the side of the stage, I would think. For sure, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, that's super cool. Is there more left in Is there more light? Is there more left? Visiting this record for this new release, what was it like to go back to that uh, album? What do you make of it now, having spent some time away from it? Well, I was really surprised when Russell called me last October and said that they were planning to re-release it because the uh, Edgar Wright documentary had garnered a lot of attention for Sparks. And everybody kept asking, but where's Noel?" <laughs> and and what happened during the filming of that documentary was that I was in touch with Edgar Wright's assistant and was supposed to be interviewed, but he got carried away in Los Angeles and they ran out of time. And so that's why I wasn't included. But Russell said, we've had so many inquiries. Uh, would you be willing to... Uh, do some liner notes for a re-release of the album. And I was just absolutely thrilled because I, I never thought that the album got the attention it deserved. I absolutely love Sparks' music and the lyrics are so clever and timely, well, and timeless. 
mm-hmm. um, that I was thrilled to hear that they were going to get give it another release. It's interesting because I feel like amongst Sparks fans, uh, and you know, whose legion has grown since the film, uh, there is so much legend and uncertainty around this record. The the rumors and all of this, nobody really knows. It's a lot of have you heard this record and this very quiet whispered, you know, here, listen to this. Um, <laughs> have, <laughs> And it's amazing because I feel like there's so many in preparing for this, listening to other people, reading stuff, people talking about this record, everyone has all these assumptions about it. And were you aware of all of this or was this just, it's a record I did. I've done other stuff since then. You're basically, you're busy living your life after this album comes out, I'm assuming. Oh, I, I went on with my musical career. Um, the minute that Richard Branson told my attorney that they did not, and uh, that Virgin Records did not intend to release the video that I had done with Mickey Dolenz, nor did they intend to exercise the option to uh, extend the contract to the required, well, they had originally agreed to six album releases. So um, that was kind of devastating. And then when I get, didn't get any tour support and I was not uh, allowed to go tour in Europe and I was consigned to 10-day tour in England and Scotland and then some appearances in New York and Boston and up to Quebec, uh, to Montreal, and back to L.A., down to Arizona, and that was pretty much it. So... I'm not surprised that there's been so much uh, mystery surrounding the album. It didn't get the attention, nor was I allowed to promote it and and talk to people enough to (laughs) answer questions about what happened. It has to be so interesting to come back to it and now be able to do that. It, it, it has to just sort of, I, I don't know, it just has to, I don't want to put thoughts in your head, but that it just has to, it, it, does it feel surreal? Does it feel su- exciting? Does it feel, told you so? I, I don't know. I feel like I'd be like, I just want to <laughs> sort of laugh at Richard Branson. I don't know. <laughs> I, <laughs> That's how I would feel. <laughs> when, when I saw Russell's name come up on my phone and I answered the phone, I said, Russell? <laughs> and he, he said, Noel, <laughs> we've decided to re-release the album because people have been asking since the documentary, where's Noel? And um, I was just beyond excited and thrilled that um, people were interested. And I love the music so much. I was just over the top uh, happy that they were going to give it a second go. And we I actually had been sent the master of the video that Mickey did. And I was able to send that to them. And now it's been remastered and they're going to release the video with the CD release. So, wow, people will finally get to see me performing. <laughs> and the suffering that you had during the making of that video will finally be worth something well <laughs> the the very strange thing is in reviewing that video the taping mickey mm-hmm. was really artful at um making me appear strong and capable mm-hmm. i was really grateful for that so uh, i thought he did a, a really good job of editing and and I think the image I was trying to portray anyway for Sparks' particular brand of, of not your usual disco, <laughs> um, I think that image will come across to viewers now. And they'll see that I, I wasn't like Adonis Summer or anyone else doing disco. It was it was more a combination of electro, punk, uh, a little darker um, than regular disco songs, and I think the lyrics show that too. I was, I was trying to match what 
message they were trying to get across in their songs. And that's one of the things I've heard people say, like their take on something like dancing is dangerous, that they are reading it as a warning. And I saw it as nothing but a sort of the males playing with the irony of saying this is dangerous, but it's dangerous because it's so much fun and all of that. What did you make of these songs when they play you them the first time and you're hearing them? What Did they give you well, any I sense totally as to what it. they were? I totally mm -hmm. got it. When I was doing professional modeling, my girlfriends and I, because we were strictly forbidden by our agent to go out after a fashion show, and we were working for the very top designers all over L.A. I mean, names that you would recognize, Carl Lagerfeld and... Um, Jeffrey Bean and Oscar de la Renta and <laughs> my agent had a very strict policy of you do that you walk the the <laughs> you walk the runway you get off you leave you don't socialize with anyone we had people coming up to us you know like models would saying oh come in and decorate my party <laughs> be somebody's arm candy you know uh, but we weren't allowed to do that. So we would gather one another up into uh, a couple of automobiles, and we would go down to Studio One, um, which was just a riotously fun and harmless venue for models to go and dance with all of the, <laughs> the wonderful men on the dance floor who were not a threat at all. And we would just dance until we were absolute puddles mm -hmm. and have a wonderful time. And that's the really positive side of dancing is dangerous because you never want to mm -hmm. stop having fun like that. I mean, it, right. we do get out of there like after two o'clock in the morning <laughs> because we were so excited at having had such a successful fashion show. And we wanted to work off some of that energy of walking the runway. And there was no better way than to go dancing down at Studio One. So, um, yeah. Uh, but I had a I had an experience in New York when I went. I had to make an appearance at midday at an underground disco, and I saw the other side of what Sparks was trying to convey in that song. Uh, you know, you you walk in broad daylight down these dank, narrow stairs into this underground nightclub that's filled with cigarette smoke and very drunk people. Mm -hmm. And they're not even paying attention to you trying to perform on the dance floor. <laughs> and they're yelling to themselves and everybody they know there, hey, she's lip syncing. <laughs> and, <laughs> I, and I have a live I have a live microphone and I'm walking over to them going, I am not. I am singing. <laughs> and they don't even hear me. Of and course. their friends are going, of course she's not lip syncing. Look, she's talking to you. <laughs> I'm so drunk. <laughs> they, don't, they don't even know. So that's the very dark side of Dancing is dangerous when you feel like you're caught in a trap like that. That's a living nightmare. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> a whole different CD side of discos that I never knew existed until then. To, to go to the actual recording, what was that process like? Where, Because Ron and Russell, I believe they produced the record. Uh, they did. They produced they, it and... Uh, I'll tell you, everything happened so fast, and mm -hmm. I could not break my contract, so I had to continue to model during that time, wow. and they would lay down. Uh, we had one rehearsal at their studio at their home uh, in Beverly Hills, and then we were, you know, they were recording backing tracks, including the background singers, before I could get in to lay down my lead vocal. Wow. So uh, Russell was kind of singing along uh, so that the background singers could know when to come in. And then I would come in sometimes 11 o'clock at night. And mm. I was very fortunate to be able to meet some of the incredible players they 
had perform on the album, and I'm so thrilled that they're finally getting credit, and people will know what a quality product those albums were. Uh, people like Paulino da Costa, who went on to perform for everybody. I think I saw him with James Taylor and and uh, several times in concert. He I walked up to him one time on stage, and he had remembered meeting me. Uh, it was it's such a gracious man and such a brilliant percussionist. And Michael Brecker on saxophone. Oh my goodness! Mm. When I started singing jazz here in Northern California, all the jazz musicians were going, "You met Michael Brecker?" <laughs> <laughs> I said he performed on the album. So that was just a real pinch me time. And meeting Peter Chang and Peter Chang brought in. Uh, a plywood box and opened it up and inside was this most incredible synthesizer bigger than any synthesizer I had ever seen and I said Peter what on earth are you carrying this expensive incredible product around in a plywood box and he said you know in Asia we have this uh, saying of kashkoi I said, what is that? He said, well, you make something very valuable look very cheap. <laughs> and I said, how brilliant is how brilliant is that? So he he set up and programmed that enormous synthesizer, and Ron played the parts. So I got to I got to even in spite of having to work on average six days a week while we were recording the album. I still got these precious moments of meeting the players, some of the players, and the background players, the Maxine and and Oren and Julia Waters family. I did not get to meet them, and I was so sad because I loved singing along to their backing vocals. I wish I had been able to meet them, but um, they're well, also credited. I was going to say, that's one of the sort of rumors about the record. There's a lot of, oh, you can hear Russell singing back up. It's not. It's Julia Maxine and, and Orrin Waters, correct? Yes. And it's clearly, I mean, Ron and Russell were off on tour to support Number One in Heaven. And Virgin Records just kind of dropped the ball, unfortunately. And mm -hmm. My name was incorrectly spelled on the album cover. They put the umlauts over the O instead of the E, and they didn't give any of the brilliant players and background singers credit. So no wonder rumors were flying. It was, it was a glaring omission on their part that should never have happened. I was very sad about that. What was the collaboration like with the males um, coming in and were they were they open to you saying, well, what if I sang it like this? What if we changed this word here? You know, that kind of stuff. Were they open to that sort of let's work together? Let's see what we can make. Can we punch make these songs even better than they already are? I'll tell you, we were on such a tight deadline that I didn't have time to collaborate with them. But they were really gracious about letting me ad lib in my own style and letting me sing the songs in my own style that I thought fit their music. And so to that extent, we collaborated, but they already had the songs down on tape. So there wasn't a lot of wiggle room to do a lot of changing. And honestly, their lyrics were so brilliant. I didn't see any need to change not a word mm -hmm. so uh, I pretty much sang what was put in front of me and uh, like I mentioned you know I was kind of on a time crunch this this was so whirlwind I just couldn't even believe that it was happening as rapidly as it was I, I was barely able to get <clears throat> uh, a friend recommended me to David Bowie's attorney Stan Diamond and I was barely able to get ink on the contract before they had already left to France stop for a record deal. So uh, unbelievable. They, they like to work fast. <laughs> you know, they, 
they contacted me about the re-release last last October 4th. And here we are uh, promoting the album and they've already released the, the album and now we're on to the CD release and I've done several interviews and it's just so exciting. I just have to keep pinching myself. Is this really happening? It's 45 <laughs> years later. <laughs> like what's coming next? You know something else is coming, especially with them. Just You know something else is around the corner. Like next the video and then something else is coming. Yeah, I do believe that they have plans to go. They have been offered... Um, a directorial debut, making a movie. I, I don't know any more than that, but uh, they said they would be going to France for that. So, I you know, they've always there's... been. The I know. Guys are... <laughs> I know, but I feel there's more with you. Oh, I don't I feel... know. I don't. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> I'm not psychic, but I don't know. I just feel it. <laughs> Get ready. Well, <laughs> yeah. well, I'm really super excited that people are finally going to get to see the video. So that's that's a real thrill to me. Well, and just because, to have this music. Uh, I, I was, I, I was uh, working with top fashion designers, Gregory Poe, Edgar Allan Poe's nephew, uh, or grandnephew. Uh, he had a line of clothing. Uh, in the opening scene of the video, I'm wearing one of his see-through fishing vests over a Amazing. blue leotard. You'll, you'll see that. It was pretty outrageous stuff for the day. And, um, yeah, <laughs> I had lots of designers. Elka Lesso, who designed oh. for her own line called Zoe, uh, she designed a lot of my stage clothes for me. And then... Zandra Rhodes was a big fan. I have a, a letter and a scarf that she sent me after I modeled for her, and she did some really outrageous neon pieces for me. Uh, and Norma Kamali, uh, she did, uh, loved for me to wear her clothes. And uh, that blue tight jumpsuit I wear on one of my EPs, that mm -hmm. was a Norma Kamali. Uh, so, wow, was I blessed to have all those designers at my beck and call begging me to wear their clothing <laughs> amazing pretty... well the cool yeah. thing about the video is it takes all of your, it's like all of your talents in one piece right <laughs> it's your musical talent your modeling talent your acting talent. it's everything in one one piece you can see it, pieces of all of the absolutely. things you do together absolutely have you seen it already the video i haven't seen the video I oh, the music, I'm, but I have not seen the video, and I'm dying yeah. to see the video. Uh, you'll see maybe a couple of shots of me in this green sparkly outfit that I wore on the cover of the album. Mm -hmm. That was a two-piece um, tight mesh pull-on uh, mm -hmm. stockings. Oh, it was so scratchy. But anyway, oh, of course. I, <laughs> I would be. Hate, I made the Hawaiian style recording tape skirt that fit over it. So when, <laughs> I also took sewing lessons. My mother was quite the seamstress and I grew up sewing my own clothing. So uh, I was kind of clever at that as well. And um, I made it, I just <laughs> went in the recording studio, got a roll of recording tape, uh, half inch recording tape, cut it into strips and put it over a belt and there it was. So amazing. You'll notice that that was one of my That's own creations. <laughs> even better, your own designs. That's amazing. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Oh. So I I loved being um I was, you know, an art major in college and always loved creating things. So to have that opportunity and to work with some of the best designers and musicians. Wow. It was just a Thanks. thrill. And I had, I had always been consigned to kind of being a part of a band and a backup singer at that. And sometimes getting a lead song on the disco songs or the club songs, the rock songs we performed. 
but never dreamed I'd have my own solo recording album. So, wow. That was just mm-hmm. so unexpected. Well, wow. and so the males kind of discovered you or or first saw you playing at the Troubadour, which is the most L.A. You might have, like, with Schwab's closed that afternoon, basically. Right. Um, but it, well. it just sort of <laughs> seems like this, it, it, this, you know, it was meant to be that they were there and, and, and saw this was the Mick Smiley band, correct? Yes. It was really serendipitous. I do believe, I kind of explained this in my notes to you, that um, someone at Sound Arts, where they had recorded Number One in Heaven, uh, I, I had recorded some background vocals for the soundtrack of Hawaii, the IMAX movie, Mm-hmm. with Basil Polidorus and knew several of the engineers who worked with him at that studio. So I do believe someone at Sound Arts probably mentioned me. At, I, I bet Ron and Russell were talking to them about looking for talent to produce, and that's why they were at the Troubadour that night. But n- no one I knew at Sound Arts told me that, ever. I just recently put that together because I saw an interview Ron and Russell did saying that they had recorded number one in heaven at Sound Arts. And I didn't know that before. So the whole thing. someone it's will have just... to ask them. That's where they heard about me. <laughs> I love it. So you, you mentioned a little bit, you kind of talked about the touring or lack thereof for the record. Um, and touring with a band and then touring with a dance record like this are two completely different experiences. Night and day. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, night and day. I you... I never prepared, nor was I enamored of having to tour by myself. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> It's very lonely out there. And um, when you don't have anyone to bounce off of or share experiences with, it feels very surreal and isolating to be on tour by yourself without a band and just with a tour manager. So uh, not my favorite, but I learned a lot in the process. And... um, was very grateful to at least have the opportunity to do some kind of tour. Yeah, it sounds incredibly isolating. It was, it was. I mean, it it was really wonderful to meet the people who interviewed me uh, for various fanzines and and newspapers and... um, it was incredible meeting people at the clubs, but I didn't, I wasn't afforded very long to hang around. We were on a pretty tight 10 day tour of England and Scotland, and we went to a lot of different venues in, in that 10 day period. And in, I'd be doing interviews with press at 8.30 in the morning after being at a club Oof. until two and so it was grueling. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> and, and I did have a preliminary tour. Richard brought me over early to just kind of get acquainted with England, and I had a, a cadre of five young men who showed me around and took me to some interviews and introduced me to real fish and chips and took me down to Pilla- mm-hmm. Piccadilly Circus and Harrods, and uh, that was a blast. Uh, they kept me laughing the whole time. And it was just great to be traveling with a cadre of young men. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You got to travel with someone. The young girls girls who worked at Harrods were just bowled over when we walked in and just so accommodating because they, and the the young men were going, oh, the birds like us. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) (laughs) They just oh, kept me laughing the whole time. But touring, touring, I was just with my tour manager, Peter Price, and he was a love. He was just so charming. 
and very protective of me. But, uh, you know, he kind of set me loose on the dance floor to sing my songs, and, and there I was out there by myself in a disco trying to entertain people who had come there to dance, not to just watch me sing my 10-minute song. So uh, it, it was really strange until we got to Glasgow, and the warehouse allowed me the luxury of staying there until they closed the club. And I got to know the young people on the dance floor and dance with them. And we were all singing together the songs we all knew. And then I got to sign their albums for them and individually personalize each album and sign their names with a glitter pin, I, uh, a set of glitter pins in different colors I had purchased just for that person, that purpose. I thought I was going to get to do that everywhere I did appearances, but Usually it was, okay, you're on for two minutes, and then we're going to whisk you away. And what do you mean? <laughs> so, yeah, it was <sighs> not my favorite, but a real a real learning experience, and I'm not regretful at all. Well, and it just must make this whole resurgence of interest in, in your work and in the record that much more fulfilling, because I feel like... One, the music and the record clearly stand the test of time, which not every album you can say that about. But also you kind of get you get to hear people who have loved this record for a long, long time and and wished what is happening with it now, that it's out on CD, that it's going to be available to everybody. That, you know, you kind of get that, you one, get a second shot at, you know, hearing from people who, who were really affected and touched and loved the record. It's got to be a great thing to kind of have this, you know, moment in your life, have this resurgence and just to get to enjoy it all again. And, and you know what, Luke, there's also the side of me finally being able to talk to my fans mm. and the liner notes and the video they finally get to see who I am and what I brought. And that is everything to me because I wanted to represent Ron and Russell's music the way I envisioned representing it for them wanting a female counterpart to sing these particular songs to represent them. And I've spoken to them and they're very pleased with the way everything turned out. And it's just such a thrill and privilege and honor for me to represent them in this way and, and to quell some of the rumors that have been flying around that I wasn't even aware of all these years. But I understand because I, I just dropped off the face of the earth and I never got to really know the fans like I should have. I mean, we just didn't get the support from Virgin that we should have. And and that was a sad thing. Uh, Richard was on to the Sex Pistols. Uh, I mean, Sex Pistols came on the scene and Richard said, see you later, bye. This goes dead. So that was sad. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, it's really sad. It, it's really a, a lovely thing that I get to have this moment representing the Sparks other side. <laughs> well, but also because representing we, we, yourself, too. We have right. this vision. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. We shared this vision, and, and I very much connected with them and their music, and I want people to see that. So it's just a real thrill for me now. That's awesome. wonderful. I mean, it's... I love it. Just knowing more about your story and how you got to that album and where you've gone since then, it just makes the record so much more, I don't want to say poignant, but like there's, you hear more character, you hear more personality yeah. in it, but really your voice, it becomes a more important part of the record, the more kind of filling in the back backstory there is. Right. I wasn't, I wasn't just someone that they hired to sing their songs. Exactly. I no. They they sought me out. They saw my potential. They thought I fit what they were looking for, 
and their music. And, and we really collaborated in that way. And I, I am so thrilled uh, that that will now come to light. Is There More to Life Than Dancing by Noel is available right now wherever you get your music for the record and a bunch of other things, including t-shirts and, and some really cool uh, cardboard stand-ups of the Nail Brothers. You can find that at the official Sparks store, which is store.allsparks.com, and the Sparks website is allsparks.com. Rock and Roll Grad School is produced by the Professional Production Company. Please be sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts because your impassioned review is just as honest as us standing backstage waiting to come back on for the encore. For more information, you can check out our website, rockandrollgradschool.com. And like everyone else, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Today's show is recorded and produced by Heidi Hagquist and myself from our world headquarters located on the second floor of the professional office building, centrally located downtown. Our reluctant executive producers are John Sobey and Sandy Stone. Our willing executive producers are Rachel Allen and Randy Jeanette. Our intern is Zach Jackson. This one's for Philippe. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Drive safe. May all your favorite bands stay together.